Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. So Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, Paul writes, By the Spirit of the Lord, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Charles Spurgeon, considered the prince of preachers, once wrote, Stand still, keep the posture of an upright man, ready for action, expecting further orders, cheerfully and patiently awaiting the directing voice. And it will not be long ere God shall say to you as distinctly as Moses said it to the people of Israel, go forward. So I want to welcome back to our series titled On Waiting on God. And and we are in this series because we live in this tension between the reality that we are impatient and we hate to wait and the fact that God created us to do just that, which is to wait on Him. We live in this tension that, that, that waiting is how we are designed, but our flesh and our nature hates it and rebels against it and resents it. But the fact still remains we were created by God to wait on Him. And in the first week, we began asking the question of why we need to wait on God. And, and the short answer is God is everything that we are not, and He is everything that we need. And then in the second week, we began talking about waiting on God when our lives change, because if there's anything that's constant in life is the fact that everything changes. And then last week, we talked about waiting on God when life is hard, because another constant in life is the fact that we are that we all face difficulties in our, in our lives. Now, if you've not been here in the last three weeks or so, um, we have covered a great deal of ground, and I would encourage you to go back and listen to the, those messages if you, if you have time. And you can do that by going to our church's YouTube channel, or you can go to our SoundCloud page, and uh, the, the links to those are in your bulletin. Uh, but this week, we're going to bring this to a close and wrap up this short series, and we're going to talk about waiting on God in probably the most important sense. We're going to talk about waiting on God to finish His redemptive work here on earth. Waiting on Him to make all things right when when Christ finally returns. Because as Christians, if there's anything that we're looking forward to is the promise that Jesus will one day come back and make it all right and complete His redemptive work. We are waiting for the time when As it says in Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. That is our hope. And so that is what we're going to address today, waiting on God for his return. Now, let me first start off by saying we're we're talking about how to wait on God for his return. And I'm going to say that again because I want to be really clear. We're going to talk about how we wait for Christ to return. And what I mean by that is we're not going to talk, what I mean by that is we're going to talk about how we are to live 
We're going to talk about how we're going to behave and act as Christ followers as we actively, continually wait for that day. And because of that, today's conversation is not about the timing of his return. Even though that many of us and many Christians around the world tend to get fixated on the timing. Let me be upfront and clear. We were talking about the manner in which we wait, not the timing by which Christ will come back and fulfill all of his promises. Because the truth is, as Christ himself has said, no one knows the timing of his return. In fact, if there's something that's Important to remember, especially in today's social media saturated world where there's a lot of people who think they know the answers, that's worth writing down. No one knows the timing of Christ's return. And if somebody says that they do, when, when G, if they know when Jesus is coming back, whether it's in a book or in a, a conference or on a social media post, you can just dismiss them out of hand because Jesus himself said in his own words, nobody knows but God himself. And so we're not going to talk about the timing of Christ's return. And today's conversation is not going to be about the conflict in the Middle East or the part that the United States will play in the, the final conflict or the identity of certain characters or the men of lawlessness. The truth is, people have speculated on those things for centuries, and time has proven again and again that much of that speculation is just simply that. It's just speculation. In fact, when I was a kid, I remember... Um, from the time I was very young all the way to a young adult, um, the, the Christians in my life never really spoke to me about the gospel. They never spoke to me about the things I needed to hear. What they talked about was the end times, and they talked to me about something called Armageddon. In fact, I had a little t-shirt when I was a little kid that said Armageddon on there, right? Uh, I was surrounded by Christians, but nobody really actually talked to me about the things I needed to know, which is knowing the living God. And nobody talked to me about the power of God to save, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. They talked to me about things like the Antichrist. And, and some have even said, I'm, in their own words, that it was Nikita Khrushchev. Some said that it was Ronald Reagan. Some said it was Mikhail Gorbachev. But, in, but alas, they've all been proven wrong. And even today, people still speculate. Some have said that it was Barack Obama. I remember when people said that. Today, that people will, will stand up and you know, affirm that it's Donald Trump, and some will say that it's Pope Francis, and even some will even say that it's Bill Gates. But throughout history, there's been a lot of speculation on these things, but the truth is, though, nobody really knows those answers. No matter how passionate a person may feel, no matter how many books they write, no matter how many conferences they speak at, and no matter how many people follow them on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. And with that being said, that's not the stuff that we're going to talk about today. We're not going to talk about the differing views of eschatology or the theology of the end times. And that's certainly an important conversation to have at some point, but that's not the focus of today's message. Today, we're not going to talk about things like preterism or premillennialism or interadvental amillennialism or hyperdispensationalism or covenant theology or 1689 federalism or a host of other theological words and perspectives. Today's concern isn't how the end will come or even when. Today is how we are to live knowing he will come. How are we going to carry on waiting for Christ to finish what he has started? How we are to conduct ourselves as followers while we patiently wait and endure in this life for that time? How are we supposed to live as we wait for the return of Christ, whether it's tomorrow or a thousand years from now? And I, I want to share with you what that looks like to actively wait on God to come back. And I have, I have a number of text. We started with one, but um, there's a number of texts I'd like to share with you this morning that I think that would really give us a clear handle on what the Christian life is supposed to look like as we endure and wait as we've been designed to for God to do what God needs to do in a way that honors Him. And the very first text I want to look at is what Paul says in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, um, beginning in verse 1, the apostle writes, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and 
worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. In this text, there are a couple of things I'd like to point out that, that I think will help us to understand how it is that we are to endure and patiently wait for Christ to make things right. Number one, Paul says the grace of God has appeared and is training us. The grace of God is training us for a purpose. And that purpose is to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. As we wait for God to return, we are to grow in our ability to repent and turn away from our sins and the lust of this world. The, the grace of God trains us for that, and it trains us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. It does so as we wait for Christ. Right? Waiting on Christ's return means training and growing by the grace of God in order to renounce and repent and turn away from sin and the worldly passions that tempt us. And, and, and we are to learn while we wait to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives, which means we're to become more like God who is holy. And so the short answer is waiting on God is about growing in personal holiness. Right? And, and I want to be careful here because when I say things like that, Sometimes people will fall into one of two extremes. One will say, wait a minute, you mean to say that we need to do something to be saved? That is not what I'm saying at all. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But that transformation and that new nature is, a, is to enable us to grow in our sanctification towards holiness. Now, the other extreme is those then who say, that means that you better do all the rules and fuck. That is not what we're talking about here. The thing that we need to see is waiting on God is about growing in personal holiness, and it's about progressively by the power of the Spirit and through, the, through the, the corrective nature of the Word to kill the sin in our lives through grace and seeking to live obedient to God's Word, not as the root of our salvation, but as the fruit of our salvation. And the sad thing is I know many people who profess Christ who tend to get fixated on different parts of their theology and know all of the details, and they can tell you everything there is to know, right? And they can explain in graphic detail about their theology, but they don't then live like they know their theology. I've witnessed people who were zealous and obsessed about knowing everything they can about a particular end time scenario, who appear knowledgeable and religious to people in their lives, in, in, in their circle, but then behind closed doors, who are monsters to the people that, that love them the most. There's a duality oftentimes in Christianity that exists that, 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 that ought to cause us to really pull back and examine. I've seen people who've had hundreds of books on a given theological topic. I've seen people who were right, completely right in their theology about something, but, but that doesn't translate into their hearts and the way that they treat other people. It doesn't matter what end of the theological spectrum you end up on, by the way. Even worse, I've seen people who have been evangelized with a very soft gospel message, and, and they've been told to pray some prayer and invite Jesus into your heart so they can escape the coming judgment, even if your life doesn't even change or any, exhibit any fruit of repentance. In fact, many of these people who claim to truly trust Christ have no personal holiness in their life at all. They just made a profession of faith, and they believe that if Christ returns in their lifetime, that they're going to be good. And all the while, while living the opposite of what Paul is saying here, many of them live as if the Word of God doesn't make any difference. They have, again, came emotionally up to an altar at some point, or they've raised their hand during an invitation, 
but nothing is actually changed in their hearts and their lives. In fact, I had somebody come up, uh, pull up in the parking lot here, and the guy popped out of um, his truck. Actually, when I say popped out, he kind of stumbled out, and he knelt on the back steps as if he was going to pray, and then I had just approached him and asked if I could help him, and he said, and he, and, and, and his, he basically said, not really, and I could tell that he was, he was very inebriated. And so I said, I really want to help you. And he says, well, all I need is just a little Jesus. I was like, what? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I've been kind of bad lately. And, you know, I just need to come here and just get close to Jesus again. I said, okay. Then he goes back to his truck, sits down, and then grabs the open uh, beer in his, in his console. And I said, I... I don't think it's a little Jesus what you need. I, and he's like, yeah. I just like, no, no. So hear me. I said, uh, you need to repent and believe the gospel. So I'm not judging you. I said, but, you know, I think that you really need to understand what the gospel is, and you need to repent and believe the gospel. And he proceeded to tell me, no, no, I was, I'm good. In fact, he goes on to explain to me that he was, he, he was led to faith by a famous preacher down south, and, and he was baptized by this, this famous preacher. And he says, no, I'm good even though that he daily reveled in drunkenness, and even though he's been divorced four times as a believer, and he is still promiscuous, and I asked him about that, and he says, well, I can't give that up. I love the ladies, right? But he, in his own mind, believed that he was good, even if Christ were to return right now. And I told him what I tell everybody else. I can't judge your heart. I am not that I'm not that, that, that person. Only God can judge a person's heart. I said, but what I can do is tell you what the scriptures say and warn you, right, that, that you need to examine yourself and see if you are in the faith in light of what the scriptures say. Friend, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm afraid that you're in real danger. And he's like, no, no, I'm good. And then he drove off. And the difficult, is, the difficult part is there's a lot of people that are they're just like him. Our country that professes, even though the number is declining, a high percentage of people who, who, who are Christians, when you ask them what they really believe, you find out they really don't know who God is. Right? Now understand, it's, it's not how you're living It, it's, it's, it's not how we, that's not how we're to live as we wait for Christ. Again, I'm not preaching any kind of legalism, but if you met the risen Christ, if Christ has truly come into your heart, if you have been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit and you have seen who God really is, something in you begins to change. And we are called by the scriptures unapologetically and unambiguously to walk in personal holiness before God, waiting for Him to return. And, and we are, by the grace of God, to seek to obey Him and pursue holiness in our personal lives. And again, I want to be really careful here. This is not about you writing out a list of things that you need to do and don't do. It's about growing and understanding His Word and seeking His guidance and His help to, to put to death the sin in your life and to follow him. But the, by the way, I tell people all the time, before you master the book of Revelation, you need to master the book of Romans. Before you master any you know, particular eschatology, the most important thing to master is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Before you master your, the identity of certain figures of the end times, or before you decide that, hey, you know, this denomination is better than that denomination, the most important thing for you to do is to get clear about who God is and then who you are in light of who God is. Before you try to figure out those things, focus on the gospel. In fact, one of the things I want to share with you next is what Paul says here. We, we are waiting for a blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and purity for himself, a people for his own possession who were zealous for good works. A people zealous for his good works. 
This is the second thing we need to take notice of, that God wants us to be purified. He wants us to walk in personal holiness, but He wants us to be zealous for good works. In other words, he, wa- he wants us to be passionately engaged in His service, the good works that He has already called us to. As we wait and labor for Christ to return, as the world spins out of control, He doesn't want us to wring our hands wondering what do we do. He wants us to get busy serving Him as we wait for Him. In fact, Paul tells us that's the reason why we were saved. Ephesians chapter 2 Beginning in verse 8, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For, or because, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, right? That word for tells us there's a purpose for, for what He's done for us, right? We were created in Christ for good works, which God has performed prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has already planned things for us to be doing as we wait on Christ. He has good works for us to accomplish. You were saved by grace through faith, and as such, there's something that God wants to accomplish in and through you, which means we have work to do as we wait for Christ to return. The thing is, If Jesus comes back a hundred years from now, if you wait patiently for the Lord doing the work that He's called, then you will spend your entire life getting things done for His kingdom. But if Christ comes back tomorrow, then He will find you readily engaged in doing the work that He's called you to do. Either way, whether tomorrow or a hundred years from now, God is glorified in what He's doing through you. So we wait on God to train us in godliness, and we wait by getting busy doing the work that God has called us to do. And now the second text I want to share with you is from the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Peter writes these words. This is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them I'm stirred up. I, I am stirred up your sincere mind, by the way, a reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through the apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing, following sinful desires. One of the things that I think that sometimes we can get confused about is we see things like that, and we want to read that in our current context, but the truth is there have been always scoffers scoffing and people pursuing their sinful desires desires. Peter's point isn't to tell you when the end is going to happen. Peter's point is to tell you that we need to be ready to meet Christ. He says, knowing first of all that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own desires. In verse 4, he says, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For sincere, for ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, there are people around us that will say, things are just going the way they're going, so when is Christ coming? For they deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and by and that by means of these, that the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth are now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Peter tells us that that day is coming. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is of a a thousand years and a thousand years a day. In other words, God's timing is completely different than our own. And then he says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You have to see this right here. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing any should perish, but that all should come should reach repentance. The reason why Christ has not already come 
The reason why God has not already judged the world is because he's patiently withholding his wrath right now so that people will repent and come to faith. That's what he's saying. He's saying that God's wrath and judgment will come and they are stored up and they're ready to be poured out, but God is patiently withholding those things so that people will come. And and the picture I'd like to share with you is one that I heard from another preacher, Paul Washer. He says this, God with one hand is holding back his wrath and his justice. And with the other one, he is reaching out to the sinner, calling him to himself to come and be saved. But a time is coming when both of those hands will be put aside and it will be too late. Now, what does that mean for me and you then as we eagerly await for Christ to return? Well, it means we need to wait for God's return by evangelizing the lost and calling people to repent and believe the gospel is what it means. Because the fact of the matter is when God finally judges the world, when he does return and fulfill all of our hope, it will be too late for those who are not in Christ. When God puts down his hands, it will be too late, whether it's 10 minutes from now or 10,000 years from now. When God judges the world, There will be no second chances. He has given us this time to preach the gospel. He has given you and I this time to share with our community and our friends and our neighbors and even broader the hope that we have in Christ. And so we should actively wait on God by sharing with the world the word of God That is how we are to wait for him. Now look with me at verse 10 and says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, which means it can happen when we least expect it. And the heavens will pass away with a roar and the the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it be exposed, which means everything good or bad will be seen in the light of day when the end comes. And in verse 11, it says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? What we've already touched on, waiting for the hastening of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt away. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, in light of that, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. It says to be found or let God find you without spot or blemish or living in holiness as we talked about. But what I want to point out is we are to be found at peace. This is something worth thinking about. Peter says, as you wait on Christ's return, as you wait for God to come and judge the world and set all things right, that we are to be found by Him at peace. Now, this is important because if there's anything I know about many of us in many of our lives is we're really not always at peace. He was a Christian when Christ comes, you're supposed to be at peace. But again, right, right now, many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are completely stressed out, not at peace. Many of them are, are frustrated. Many are, are worried, sick about the future. 2020 and COVID-19 really expose the fact that a lot of people are not at peace. The war in the Middle East right now that's going on reveals that a lot of people are not at peace. Our current political climate and the coming election and the fear of death and the worry about money all reveal that many of us Christians are really struggling to be at peace. So many are fearful and worried and anxious and and angry. Some people are worried about worried sick about family members. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about going to the doctor. They're worried about the future of our nation. 
Some people are stressed out by relationships. They're stressed out about the economy. People are stressed because people don't agree with them and everything that they have to say. And by the way, that goes for both sides of the spectrum. Some people are wound up and stressed out about politics because of this, this election year. Some people are in gut-wrenching, I mean, I've heard it, I've seen it, in gut-wrenching, anxious turmoil at the prospect that Joe Biden just might be elected again. Other people lose sleep at night thinking about Donald Trump ascending to the Oval Office once again. All of whom are forgetting one immutable fact, that it is God who puts people in power. Many people are just not at peace over these things. And worse, some people are even struggling with bitterness and unforgiveness and frustration with other people. And that, and that bitterness, and, and the bitterness that people have for other people, especially for people who have differing opinions on a number of different subjects, that bitterness staggers me. The divisive, the, the division in our country is, it just breaks my heart. I've seen family members who just don't talk to each other just because of they decide, I believe this and you believe that, and we can't talk anymore. There are people who are so dug in on these things that they have little patience and even less grace for those who see things differently, and that includes Christians. Many people are not at peace with the people in their own lives. But here it is that Peter says, right here in his letter, right along with being spotless, he says, be found at peace. When Christ returns, let him find you at peace. We are to be at peace as we wait on God. And that, that goes for all of the ways that we wait on God. When we wait on God in our devotional time, when we wait on God when life changes, when we wait on God when life is hard, and when we're waiting for his return. In all of the things that we, in the ways that we wait on God, we are to strive to be at peace as we wait on Him. But how? Okay, Pastor, you're telling me, you beat me up on this. I confess it. I'm not at peace. How? How do we get there? Well, the answer is the same as, it when, as when we started this little series. It's about what we know about God. It's about our theology of Him. You see, if we truly believe and understand that God is, in fact, sovereign and in control, and He knows all things and that He is good, and that He works all things out for the good of those who love Him, and we truly understand that we're dependent upon Him in every way for everything anyway, then peace should then follow. Because really, what is your choice in all of these things? The choice that you have as a person of faith is to trust in God. It's to lean on His understanding and not your own. Right? That's the choice that we have. If, if your theology is correct and the Bible is true, the only choice that we have is to trust Him and allow Him to work things out in His timing. That's how we have peace, is we surrender it to His control. We trust God for Him to be what He says that He is, and we trust Him to do the things that He says that He will do. In fact, the reason why many of us don't have peace is because we are still trying to control the things that we can't control. <laughs> Let's just all admit it. There is a control freak in all of us. Come on, right? The reason why you don't have peace is because you're not fully trusting in God to handle it. The reason why you don't have peace is because you keep trying somehow to sit back on that throne in your own heart where God belongs. You keep forgetting that God is sovereign and in control, and you, my friend, is powerful and as smart and talented as you are, you are not sovereign and in control. We're to be found at peace because being at peace is the fruit that, of a heart that trusts in God. Remember what he said, if God is for us, who could be against us? God has promised to never leave us or forsake us. He has promised to work all things out for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Peace is the fruit of the heart that fully trusts in God. We're to be at peace as we expectantly wait for His return. And then in verse 15, it continues, and count the patience of our Lord 
as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. By the way, I want you to notice, even the apostle Peter said, sometimes what Paul says is hard to understand, okay? If the apostle Peter wrestled with that, it's okay for you too as well. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. And by the way, the apostle Peter right there has just affirmed Paul's letters to be scripture on par with the Old Testament. And then he says, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you do not, you were not carried away with the error of lawless people and those who lose, and, and excuse me, that you are not carried away with error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It says right here to take care that you're not carried away with error of lawless people and lose your stability. In other words, you need to be careful to not get caught up and swept away by false doctrine and false theology. I'm going to tell you right now, if you survey social media, YouTube, TikTok, whatever thing, you will find there are a lot of people out there who prop themselves up as teachers that are, that are false teachers. And he says, don't get caught up in false teaching. That way you don't lose your theological stability. But, he says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter makes it clear that we need to protect our hearts and minds from false doctrine by growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Which means as we wait on the return of Christ, we need to be growing and maturing in our understanding of Christ. We need to be learning more about Him, learning more to be like Him. Which means then we are to follow the spiritual disciplines that the Scriptures have given us. Time in the Word. I can't overemphasize that. I've been preaching those words right there from the moment that I got into the pulpit. You need to be in the Word, reading the Word, studying the Word, meditating on the Word, hearing it preached. Also, prayer, getting before the Lord, making your petitions known individually and corporately. Time in the Word. Quiet time with God. Time in fellowship, being with other believers, encouraging each other and being encouraged. And corporate worship. This morning, again, the singing of the, word, of, of the truths of God. I don't know about you, but it is, it is salve for my heart. It is it is. It is food for my soul to be with you and for us all to corporately worship God. And one of the most important ways that we wait for God is that we get busy learning more about Him and to be like Him. Now, the last text I want to share with you is the one that we opened up with, beginning in, beginning in Romans chapter 8 uh, and verse 18. Paul writes, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory of, that is to be revealed to us. Waiting on God is about anticipating the fulfillment of God's promises. And it's about soberly understanding that whatever suffering we may be going through, whatever you are enduring, whatever hardships that you face, as hard and as difficult and as painful and as mind numbing as they can be, that suffering that you're going through is temporary and is nothing compared to the glory that awaits those who trust in Him. The promise for the Christian is not that life this side of heaven is going to be perfect. The promise is, however bad it is, multiply that by an infinite number and the glory that awaits us is more than you can imagine. He says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For, the, for creation was subjugate, subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to the corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together 
and the, pain, the pains of childbirth until now. All of creation eagerly waits for God to set things right. The moment sin entered the world, all of creation was sub- subjected to that curse. And not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Which is the last two things I just want to share with you and make note of about waiting on Christ. We are to wait in patience And we're to wait in hope. As the world continues to to turn, as the darkness continues to grow, as we continue to face difficulties, Christians need to be patient and we need to keep the hope that we have alive. We need to continue to remind ourselves and think about the hope, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said our suffering is not worth comparing to our hope. If that's true, then why do so many people despair? Why do so many of us lose heart? Why do so many of us get discouraged by the things that are happening? Why are so many of us so fearful? It's because we forget to keep our eyes on Christ and keep the hope that he's given us alive. You see, our hope is not to live a pain-free, problem-free life here and now. And any preacher who would say that it is, then you just need to run. Because nowhere in the scriptures does it tell you that. Our hope is not to be rich materially, right? I mean, let's just be honest. We all could use a little more money, right? None of us are going to turn down a raise, right? We already could spend it like right now without thinking about it. But I'm going to tell you right now, having more is not where our hope is. Our hope is not living in a way where everything was perfect and our hope is not getting our way all the time even though we think that it might be. Our hope is bigger than all of that. It's bigger than this this life. Our hope is not to have all of our own problems solved. Our hope is, is when this life is over, either by our death or the return of Christ, Our hope when we meet God is that we will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome home. Our hope is when we stand before God on that last judgment day and all of the charges against us are read, we hear the verdict, not guilty, because Christ has already paid the price for us. Our hope is when we step across the line into eternity that we will forever stand in the life-giving presence of God where there will be no more tears or pain or sorrow, where we have a perfect, unstained relationship with all those who trust in Christ, where we'll be united, reunited with those that, that that we love, those who have gone before us, those that we've lost too soon. We'll be reunited with our moms and our dads and our grandparents and our children. And even better, never to lose them again, ever, in all eternity. That is the hope that we hold on to. Our hope is 100% Jesus Christ. And when we despair and when we lose heart, it's because we've misplaced that hope and we put something else in its place. But let me remind you, our hope, as the hymn writer wrote, is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And so, what do we do? Well, if you're not in Christ, your only hope is Jesus Christ. No matter what you pursue in your life, you will find that life is one big empty hole and you will not be able to fill it. You might think you can do it momentarily, but I promise you, you will find yourself empty again and again and again. Whether it's food, whether it's money, whether it's fame, whether it's lust, whatever it is, whatever you decide to fill your heart with, 
you will find that it's fleeting and it will not satisfy you and it will not carry you through the difficult times of your life. And that the truth is you were created by God for relationship with him and that relationship's been severed and there's nothing you and yourself can do about it. But God in his grace and mercy sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to live a righteous life, perfect, spotless, on your behalf. And then he went to the cross where he paid the penalty for all your sin and drunk down the fullness of the cup of God's wrath, the wrath that you deserve. It's all been done. As he said, it's finished. And, and all that's required, all that's asked of you is to turn to him in repentance and faith and hold on to him and him alone and trust in him and you will be saved. Today is the day of salvation. Repent and believe the gospel. And if you are in Christ, then what we do is we continue to rest in him. That's the secret to worry, is trusting in him for who he is and remembering that the biggest battle that we'll ever face is already won. Your greatest issue that you will ever experience has already been taken care of. When you stand before God, you can stand without fear because you've been covered by the blood of the lamb. Rest in him. And when the world falls apart, obviously we do the things that we can do. We love people. We do the things that we can do to, to help. We, you know, we, do, we vote our consciences. We do the things that we feel are necessary. We get involved in things we get involved in, but all the while laboring, knowing that none of that amounts to a hill of beans apart from God's will, and that we just trust him with the result. We trust and hold on to him. And then, and then finally, brothers and sisters, this is the urgent call is for us to be waiting on God by evangelizing the lost, and they are all around us. And we don't have to be those obnoxious people who, you know, stand with sandwich boards screaming at people, right? We don't have to be beating people over the head with the Bible, right? We just need to continue to remind them, you know, by our life that we live and by the words that we use and the hope of the scripture that, that there is hope beyond this life, that we share with them the truth of Jesus Christ. And we do so again and again, understanding that we are sowers going out to sow and that all we do is so, and God is the one who gives the increase. That is our mission, brothers and sisters. Let me pray for you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.